Nem tudom, mm. majd az énekre. Okay, uh, good morning everyone. Today we have two of our AI fellows from uh, Övek and Zeynep uh, Abalı, who are both uh, PhD students in the Computation and Systems Biology group, working with professors Özlem Keskin Özkaya and Atilla Gürsoy. Uh, Damla received her BS and MS degrees uh, from Koç University in uh, 2017 and 2020. Uh, and Zeynep uh, got her BS degree in biology from Middle East Technical University in uh, 2016. And uh, she got her MS degree in data science uh, from Koch University recently in 2021. And today uh, they will uh, share their uh, efforts on uh, applying on using deep learning for predicting protein-protein interactions. Thank you, Tamla Zeynep, the stage is yours. Thank you, Aykut Hocam, for your nice introduction. Uh, and hi, good morning, everyone. I'm Zeynep. And today with Damla, we would like to present you our talk titled Prediction of Protein-Protein Interactions Using Deep Learning. We, here is our outline. We would like to start by giving an introduction and some background on proteins and protein-protein interactions. Then we will move on to related work done in the field. After stating our motivation and objectives with following this line of work, we will present you with the data set we are using in more detail and I share our current progress and comment on some of our future plans for improving our predictions. We hope that you will find this talk interesting and we are really looking forward for your feedback. Please do feel free to stop us and ask any questions you might have during the presentation. Since most of the audience may not be familiar with biological details, we would like to begin with giving some information on the technical details and terms about those. So in our group, we mostly focus on protein-protein interactions, as you may have already guessed from the title. So I would like to start answering some of the most basic questions first. What are proteins? What is a protein-protein interaction? And why are these interactions are important? So proteins are basically biological molecules that are formed as a combination of four different kinds of atoms, carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, and sulfur. So of course, these atoms don't come together randomly and form proteins. Rather, the combinations of these atoms first come together and form these 20 different amino acids. So these 20 different amino acids have each different names, and also each of them has a different letter assigned to them. So for example, the first amino acid in this figure is glycine, the smallest of the amino acids. Uh, and it has, a, it has a single letter G assigned to it. All of these amino acids also have different properties such as hydrophobicity or hydrophilicity. In other words, they may like to be in contact with water or not. Or for example, they may be positively or negatively charged. These underlying properties are actually some of the features that help us predict features for proteins using computational tools or deep learning. Mainly, these 20 different amino acids come together and form the primary structure of a protein, its sequence. Just like letters form the words and amino acids form the sequences for the proteins. Although as humans, we do not exactly understand what they mean, these letters don't form the sequences in random again, but they have some underlying information carried throughout the evolution, thankfully. Actually, this is what enables use of NLP or natural language processing methods for protein sequences. I think it, if they were to be random, it would be really hard to learn anything from them. Until now, we only talked about how the protein sequences are formed. So this data is actually Bundy. But one of the most important properties of proteins is their three-dimensional shape. Unlike what it seems like on your, what it seems like on your screen right, right now, amino acids are not these two-dimensional shapes, but rather they have this three-dimensional structure. And they come together to form the secondary structures that make up the proteins through a process known as folding. They don't wander around in this elongated stage you see but they fall to, to take part in different functions in the cell. Here, these regions shown in yellow and blue are secondary structural elements. 
So if you would like to put a name tag on them, the blue part is the alpha helix and the yellow part is the beta sheet. So a few or a lot of these secondary structural elements fold into a three-dimensional structure to form what is called the tertiary structure of a single chain of protein or a monomer. Here, I would like to take a second and state that this is the exact problem DeepMind is trying to tackle with AlphaFold how a monomer or a single chain of protein folds into its three-dimensional structure given the underlying amino acid sequence. And the study they done with complexes will be presented by Damlai shortly. Though these monomers are usually not acting alone, they usually interact with other monomers to form the proteins. And just like monomers interact with other monomers to form a full protein structure, different proteins also interact with each other as to function. To understand how protein interaction physically happens, let us take a, let us have a look to only these two chains of the protein, so a dimer. Proteins interact with each other through their surfaces from regions called interfaces. Just here, I would like to stop for a second and introduce you to a new, new term for some of you, uh, since we are going to use it in our definition for protein interfaces. So Van der Waals distance is defined as a sphere around an atom. It basically represents in the most like simple sense, the distance in which an atom can be closest to another one. So let's say we have these two atoms, then the blue dotted lines here is going to represent their demonstrational Van der Waals distance. With this in mind, let's continue to define our interfaces. Although there are several different methods in literature to define an interface, in our studies, we are using the following interface definition. We first define the set of contacting residues. In other words, amino acids. So residues are basically amino acids in protein structures. We say that if the distance between two atoms from two different chains is smaller than the sum of their Van der Waals distance plus a 0.5 angstrom, then these are called contacting residues. So they should be directly in contact with another atom from the corresponding chain. And also, any residue that has an atom closer to sink angstrom to a contacting residue. So I think blue has a better color. So this light blue atoms or residues is termed as a nearby residue. So at the end, both contacting residues and nearby residues come together and form the interface. So by the way, as a reference point, an angstrom is 0.1 nanometers or 10 to the minus seven millimeters. So these guys are pretty small. So as you can see here, although the protein chains themselves are usually always continuous, the interfaces we define computationally may not be. So until now, we summarized what the protein is, how they interact with each other, and how we define the interface regions. But another important question is why do we care? Proteins have many important functions in cell. Some of them are providing structural properties like collagen. They may regulate processes within the cell and organism, for example, through cell signaling or transporting materials and many more. Any interruptions of these functions may have detrimental effects on the organism. Even the antibodies that protect you from other harmful organisms, such as bacteria and viruses are proteins. I think all of us can see how things can go haywire from there if they cannot function properly. Most of the diseases are a result of a mutation on proteins that affect the binding site the interface, in other words, which prevents the function of a protein by causing a structural change. As an example, I think we are all very much familiar with these guys right now, but here we show the spike protein from the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Each red coat here shows a different mutation of each variant from one another. Most of the time, actually, mutations are harmless or non-beneficial to an organism. These are called nonsense mutations, so they do not benefit or harm the organism. In this case, organism is the virus. But sometimes there may be some gain of function mutations, which cause a protein to function differently than before. 
In this case, that function may be avoiding our immune system. So in other words, preventing interaction with our hard-earned antibodies by vaccines or disease, disease itself. In this case, this benefits to the virus because it is saved from being destroyed by our immune system. Another example, how understanding protein interactions may help us is actually protein drug interactions. There are more than 645,000 disease relevant protein protein interactions reported between all human interactions identified, so human interactome. One of the diagnostic and therapeutic approaches is to target this disease relevant interactions using drug like molecules. Here, we are showing one such example. So let me simply go over this figure. Normally, P53 here, as you can see, functions as a tumor suppressor and prevents the, the development of cancer in the organism. But when MDM2 binds to P53 and stops it from functioning, MDM2 binds to P53, it stops the function of P53, so now cancer can develop. So one way to combat that and let P53 function as it should is finding other molecules drug-like or small molecules that can bind to MDM2 and prevent it from interacting with P53 so that P53 go on and do whatever it is doing. Finding such molecules or drugs is extremely costly and time consuming. So it takes more than 10 years to find the drug and millions of dollars with experimental methods. Using computational or deep learning methods to reduce the number of possible, mo possible molecules from hundreds to a few of them helps both in terms of time spent because you need to try less molecules than before this way and enables us to act faster. And it is also a lot more cheaper. So instead of trying 100 molecules, you can try, for example, three. Since we are already eliminating those molecules that are not actually possible candidates. So let's say we are convinced that proteins are a key molecule, and then we are going to study them. Where do we find the data for studying these structures? The protein data bank is the repository of all experimentally determ determined protein structures. As of today, there are more than 187,000 macromolecular structures deposited. It is updated weekly, so the number keeps getting higher. And data access is pretty easy via APIs, and it's also free and also open access, of course. But one downside is it is highly redundant. So you may have multiple or sometimes hundreds of protein structures for a single protein, although all of them are probably the same structure or they are highly similar. But one of the projects in our group is focusing on creating a non-redundant, so structurally unique set of protein-protein interfaces from PDB. Uh, one important thing to note is that the sequence data is much more abundantly available than the structure data. It is predicted only around 17% of pro human proteins have experimentally determined structural data. This number is actually higher with modeling and studies like AlphaFold, but experimentally determined structure percentage keeps is still too low. But sequence data is much easier to gather. Here, you can see an example protein data bank file format. I would like to quickly go over a few columns of that so that you can make a little more sense of the data we have. This marked column here shows the atom type. This column denotes the amino acid type of the given residue or the residue type. Next one is this chain name. So if you have, or we have several different chains, more than one chain, then these will change A, B, C, D, E, and so on. These are the residue numbers. So instead of residue type, you can also have the residue number. And these are the most important ones, the coordinates of the atoms, which we are using during our structural studies. So there are several ways to represent the protein, represent protein structure for computational studies. The first one is to use a point cloud representation. Since we have the X, Y, Z coordinates, we can just put them in space. So this is a single chain of protein. And this point cloud actually represents this guy, but only the carbon alpha atoms. So each residue is a single point here. The second one is a contact map. 
This can give information to us about which residues correspond to which secondary structure. So we know that the, these guys and these guys, so when they perpendicular, denote different regions on a protein. And another common structure is, is to use graphs. So the nodes are the residues of a protein and the edges are determined with a distant threshold. So each node goes to a residue and then let's say our threshold is 10 angstrom. If two nodes are closer to each other than 10 angstrom, then we put the edge in them. Uh, sorry, may I ask something? Yes. What was the residue? Could you tell them again? Residue is the amino acid itself, actually. So uh, let me go back a lot. So sorry for this. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. So so each of these guys is a, is called an amino acid on their own. But if they are in a protein, then we are calling them residues. Okay, okay, thank you. Is it clear? Okay. I'm going back. So protein interfaces come in different sizes and different shapes. Here you can see some of them like pointed out here, but this is only like 30 of them from thousands of available structures. Right now, we have more than 600,000 interface structures coming from 100,000 protein structures in our data set. And it is expected that around 23,000 of them are unique. Several studies show that structures of interface regions are well protected throughout evolution, so even though there are many possibilities to form different interface regions coming from different proteins, only a fraction of it is observed in nature. Here, I would like to stop and let Damla continue for the rest of the presentation. But before that, I would like to answer your questions related to this part, if you have any. Okay, then I'm giving the stage to Damla. Thank you, Zainab. I would like to talk about uh, two of our previous works uh, so that you understand the problem which, uh, as a group which we try to uh, deal with. First one is deep interface. Deep interface is a CNN-based method which takes two inputs as in, uh, two proteins as input uh, and try to predict if uh, they form a complex with a biologically true interface or not. On the left, you see the uh, on the right, sorry, uh, you see the model ar architecture, and uh, I will give the details of the data set later. But I can say that we use voxelized representations of proteins, and our accuracy is uh, around eighty-eight percent on the validation set and seventy-five percent in the test set. Uh, PRISM is our older but still highly uh, used uh, work. Mm, in this work, uh, the input is a single protein. We have a template set and a target set, and we are trying to find a possible uh, interacting partners of the query protein. Um, it actually performs uh, successive structural alignments uh, on the surfaces of uh, interfaces. Uh, and actually, uh, what we do is that, let's say in our template set, uh, sorry, let me say that first. Uh, in our template set, we have known interfaces. They're like biologically known as uh, Zeynep explained. Uh, let's say that we have this IL, uh, the left partner of the interface and right partner of the interface. Uh, and we know that they're interacting through this black color region. And uh, if we are trying to find the binding partner of, let's say, IL, this protein, uh, we apply structural alignment to find the protein similar to that uh, target protein. In this case, uh, this IL protein is similar to uh, TL protein. And now we need to find uh, the interaction partner of this TL protein. So again, we need to find 
uh, a protein similar to this IR because I, we know that IL is interacting with IR. Once we found such protein, we can say that, okay, uh, this interface regions are very similar to this complex. So uh, we predict that uh, TL and TR are interacting through this black colored region uh, similar to that known interface. Um, but as you see, there is no learning here. And uh, actually it's computationally a little bit slow, especially the structural alignment part. So that's why uh, we would like to replace uh, with a deep learning model. Actually, that's uh, why we uh, developed deep interface. Uh, if we could accurately predict uh, given uh, whether given a complex is biologically true or not, we can uh, replace this with a deep learning model, uh, let's say deep interface. Uh, so we can fasten the computation. Uh, but as I said, the accuracy of deep interface is around 75% on the test set, so we need an improvement, definitely. Uh, that's why, actually, our objective is to answer the following questions. How can we predict a protein's interface? How can we validate if two proteins form a true complex? How accurate the PPIs can be predicted with the deep learning? And how fast we can, bind the, we can find the binding partners of the given protein and also uh, we are using uh, chemical uh, structural properties but uh, can we combine the sequence sequential and or geometric features and will it improve the performance or not uh, first i would like to talk about our data set uh, that we use in the deep interface actually we created uh, in um, 1918, 1999, um, sorry, 2019, I'm very excited. Uh, so, sorry about that. Um, so in total, we have uh, 271,830 uh, interfaces and positive data set uh, comes from PDV and PyFace. Zainab already talked about them. And our negative data set comes from PPI for DOC and DOC ground. Uh, these data sets actually have uh, doc docking proteins, I mean docked proteins, uh, and we assess them with what we call capri critical assessment of uh, proteins. Uh, and we see that if their capri score is um, below some biologically meaningful thresholds, we say that, okay, they are not real complexes, so we can take them as negative data sets. Uh, and also, uh, I would like to describe how we use these interfaces. So first, we uh, extract our interfaces from our complexes. Then we rotated all interfaces to give them similar poses because we know that CNNs are not rotation invariant. We translated the midpoints between the centers of masses of two sides of the interfaces to the origin and rotated the centers of mass uh, onto x-axis, we also rotated the interfaces um, so that the atom which is furthest from the origin after the first transformation points to positive z direction. After the rotation and translation, um, we have 40 by 25 by 25 by 25 matrices for every interface. And the CNN model is designed to work on three-dimensional matrices with 40 channels. Uh, 20 channels uh, uh, belongs to uh, each side of the interface. And uh, 19 of these channels uh, belongs to the uh, 19 residue types, excluding glycine, uh, which is the simplest one. And the last channel is for carbon alpha atoms. The shape is determined so that every cell represents two angstrom cube of uh, 50 angstrom cube of space, which includes the interface. If an interface cannot fit into that space, uh, then this interface is not is eliminated from the data set, actually. And the Amino acids are considered as 3D Gaussian distributions with the car, uh, coordinates of carbon alpha and carbon beta as the means. Here you see that. And the standard deviation of the distributions are derived from the radio of each uh, amine, uh, amino acid type. The distributions are quantized to fill cells of matrices. 
so as I said, we start with convolutional neural networks, but deep interface uh, couldn't achieve more than 75%. So we tried different uh, CNN architectures, whether we can improve the, this accuracy. We also try some autoencoder and generative adversarial network approach. Then we actually recently turned our uh, attention to graph neural networks and point cloud registration. And also in the future, we will try attention-based neural networks and some multimodal deep learn, uh, representation learning approaches. So first we tried uh, some popular successful uh, image networks uh, to replace our deep interface and see if we can improve uh, in the accuracy. We try VGG16, VGG13, uh, ResNet and GoogleNet. Here you see we got the best results with VGG16, which is around again uh, 80%. So we still need an uh, improvement on that. Also, uh, Last year, uh, I was taking an RL course in the scope of that course. Uh, I did a network architecture search project. Uh, I trained an RL uh, agent uh, to build a CNN network, actually. Uh, so uh, my aim was uh, whether the agent's uh, CNN will perform better than a handcrafted deep interface uh, network. But unfortunately, I can only slightly perform better than that. Uh, my test accuracy was around 78%. Also, with Zeynep and uh, another friends of us, uh, we tried uh, and to re-implement, actually, uh, the SVGA paper, uh, which is a variational autoencoder with signed graphs. Uh, in the scope of unsupervised deep learning uh, course. And we add these two structural uh, features to their sequence representation. And they use a sequence representation with an adjacency matrix and they apply a variational autoencoder approach. And at the end, they use a NN classifier to uh, actually, again, predict if given two proteins are interacting or not. Uh, with a uh, regular autoencoder, uh, the accuracy was 77%. With variational autoencoder, we improved it uh, up to 96%. Um, but again, it, it was sequence, and our main focus is structure. So we need another variational uh, autoencoder to do that. We also tried a vanilla GAN approach. Uh, we use uh, many layers with convolution 2D, Rikila, uh, Relu, and Dropout. Uh, this work is actually inspired by uh, the work cited here. They were trying to uh, actually here uh, predict protein tertiary structures, but uh, we try to learn a protein representation from uh, this GAN. Um, uh, but we failed with high cross entropy loss, unfortunately. And also, we tried an autoencoder approach. Uh, our encoder here is CNN based. Uh, what we are trying to do is that actually, uh, if you remember in PRISM, we have a template set for each protein in the template set. We extract the interface and we try to learn a latent representation for it. And once a query protein comes, uh, we also take the, uh, take its interface and uh, try to see if its latent representation is sim similar to any of our template proteins so that we can, our aim is again, uh, use this model instead of structural alignment. As I said here, we are trying to uh, get out of this structural alignment step. And uh, this is our encoder architecture. We use uh, convolutional layers with relu activation, max pooling layer, and then global max pooling dropout, and finally a fully connected layer. And we use mu squared error loss, but we again failed with high losses. And actually before this presentation, we had chance to get feedback from Aikutoja and he suggest us to use uh, some con uh, contrastive uh, losses, so we will try them as well. And uh, we turned our focus from CNNs to GNNs, uh, as CNNs are 
in our case, proteins are, I mean, for the proteins, rotation is important because um, two proteins can interact uh, only through an interface. And if, we, if you rotate one partner, they will not interact because they couldn't find, I mean, the interaction site will not be correct. Also, graphs, graphs encode distance information more naturally and flexibly than voxels or pro point clouds. So we decided to go to go with GNNs. I would like to show some uh, works from the literature here related with uh, graph neural networks. Actually, uh, first one is GNN. Though this works is uh, conceptually very similar to deep interface. However. Again, as the name suggests, instead of CNN, they use uh, GNNs. First, they extract the interface, and uh, from the interface, they build two graphs. First one shows the covalent bonds between the uh, residues of the interface, and the second one, second one shows both the covalent and non-covalent interactions, actually. Uh, and they apply a a uh, graph neural network with gated graph attention mechanism. Another work is deep rank GNN. And here you see the overview. Uh, again, they have, they have an interface and they convert it to a graph. And then um, they apply, actually to build this graph, they apply some threshold as uh, Zainab uh, explained uh, the edges corresponds to the residues which are uh, below that, I mean, close to each other than given threshold. Uh, they have here uh, two types of interactions, like uh, the interacting residues in the same site and the interacting residues of different sites of the different chains of the protein, let's say. And then they apply again a network graph interaction network uh, and finally they apply two fully connected networks to predict if given proteins are interacting or not massive is another work uh, that stands for molecular surface interaction fingerprinting uh, the motivation behind this work is that a high level representation of protein structures in other words protein uh, surface displays patterns of chemical and geometric uh, features that fingerprint a protein's modes of interactions uh, with other biomolecules. So they hypothesize that uh, if proteins participating in similar interactions, they may share common fingerprints in the, uh, independent of their evolutionary history. And these fingerprints may be uh, difficult to grasp uh, by visual analysis, but we can learn them from uh, large scale data sets. Uh, from a protein structure, actually, they uh, compute a discretized molecular surface and assign geometric and chemical features to uh, every point in the mesh. Around each vertex uh, of the mesh, they ex extract a patch, and the vertices within a patch are uh, a geometric uh, vertices uh, around a patch are assigned geodesic uh, polar coordinates and massive applies a geometric uh, deep neural network to these input features and the main component of the architecture is geodesic convolution and as a result the model captures the fingerprints that are important for the interaction here uh, in the figure below uh, you see three applications of massive um, First one is um, pocket, uh, protein pocket ligand prediction. Second one is protein protein interaction site prediction. And the third one is ultra fast scanning of protein surfaces for prediction of protein protein complexes. That is, that is what we want to do with PRISM actually. Uh, but MASSIVE has a computational drawback that it uses uh, a lot of external tools to extract these surface features. and um, the feature calculation is, step is not only very complicated, but also requires uh, many computational resources and it's computationally expensive. And also inspired from Massive, there is a multi-scale representation learning study on proteins. In the study, they use two layers of graphs to represent proteins. Uh, top one is surface layer. 
Uh, this layer captures the coarser representation details of a protein. Actually, the protein surface is generated using the triangularization software, another software called MSMS. And uh, they represent this layer as a graph where each surface node has a feature uh, vector donating its charge, hydrophobicity, local curvature, etc., like massive uh, surface features. And the two surface nodes have an edge uh, if they are part of a triangulation uh, based on the MSMS results. And each surface node additionally has a residue identifier indicating the amino acid residue it corresponds to. And multiple surface nodes, of course, can have uh, the same residue identifier. Bottom layer, on the other hand, is the structure layer. This layer captures the finer representation details of a protein. And a protein typically has four structural levels, uh, primary, secondary, uh, tertiary, and quaternary, as Zeynep explained. They represent this layer as another graph where each node corresponds to a residue, and two nodes have an edge in the graph if they are uh, their carbon alpha atom close to each other within a given threshold again. And distance by thresholding uh, ensures that different structural levels are implicitly captured in the neighborhood of a node. Another uh, recent work is Equidoc. Uh, this one is a little bit different than the others. Actually, uh, the aim of uh, Equidoc is to predict the 3D structure of a protein, protein complex from the individual unbound structures of the proteins, assuming no conformational change will happen uh, during binding. In other words, they do docking, actually. They again use graph representation for given protein, and they develop a model which extends both graph matching network and the E3 equivariant graph neural networks. So. Uh, observing the success of GNNs on protein-protein interactions, we refine our uh, frame and based encoders. And currently, we are doing this again, aiming to replace structural alignment in the PRISM protocol with our deep model. And we are being inspired by graph matching networks, which measures the vector, simula vector space similarity. And Currently, we are combining graph topological features with structural features and replacing our loss function with con contrastive loss losses. And in the future, we also try transformers and multimodal learning approaches and possibly integrate sequence-based features into prediction model. And that's it from me. And I would appreciate any feedback. And if you have any questions, uh, I will be happy to answer them. Thank you, Zeynep. Thank you, Tamra. Yes, we are uh, open to questions, suggestions from our audience. So let me uh, start uh, with some of a basic uh, question. So in uh, your uh, studies so far, you basically uh, ignore this alignment step and cast this uh, prediction of uh, protein protection interactions as a binary classification uh, problem, right? Uh, yes, kind of. Uh, bin yeah, I mean, uh, uh, not. Mm -hmm. I mean, the models are not giving one or zero as an uh, output, but probability score they give. Uh, based on that probable score, we say that, okay. You, you decide. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Uh, so um, there are also some techniques that try to uh, find, so given an input to a neural network, uh, observe the output, uh, you can basically uh, back propagate that signal to the very early input player to get some idea, some uh, sense about which parts of the inputs actually contribute to that particular decision. So I think in your case, those type of uh, techniques can be also used just for some maybe sanity check. Like for example, if you know that um, these certain parts should uh, incorporate more information regarding uh, this type of an uh, interaction, Maybe you can also check whether the network also concentrates more 
on those parts of the uh, inputs. And that's just a small suggestion. Thank you, Aykut Hocam. Actually, yes, uh, biologically, we know that, for example, there are hot, hot residues which should contribute more to the binding, like to interface uh, uh, binding. Uh, and yeah, we can check that if they are the same with the model. And when you switch to a transformer-based architecture that uses self-attention, I think you can also use those type of prior information as well. So uh, yes. originally, the self-attention does not uh, differentiate uh, much. It basically uh, assumes that um, the self-attention each uh, part attend to every other parts. But if you have some prior knowledge, uh, maybe you can also apply some uh, sort of masking strategies. If you know that uh, the information uh, flow should concentrate on a certain uh, input uh, parts. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I agree that the output is very sparse, right? Like saying that something is matching or not matching is a very sparse um, signal for the network. But you have the structure which you could learn from. I think rather than trying to figure out the prior, trying to predict that structure can give you a lot of information in terms of the representation of the representation that you want to learn. But I don't know how you can do that in a way so that you can like match the two what you're doing is also like you're taking one of them only encoding it decoding it right yes yes how you can learn a representation which also involves involves information from the two of them while trying to match them somehow mm -hmm. I, I, yes i mean like here we thought that we can somehow learn like the best representation of the interface region, like what model learns how to uh, construct the structure with that information. I don't know if I could explain. What I was just trying to say, trying to decode everything in a single query might not be relevant for matching, right? Yes, actually, yeah, uh, I took, I, I mean, I inspired by drawing this fra framework with another uh, study. And in that study uh, here, like they do an encoder, like they have a latent representation. And while uh, looking at uh, the similarities here, uh, they apply some supervised learning, actually. They, again, use structural alignment to uh, force the similar vectors to the same region. Was it the one that you were seeing? I, I get what you're trying to do. I was just trying to see if there is a way of encoding them together and still, you know, learn the structure. Hmm. I see. I don't know about that. I don't know either. I was just asking. <laughs> So actually, uh, I have also something similar in mind. So uh, one way to improve the performance on a task is to come up with some similar tasks and uh, cast the training process as a multi task learning uh, setup. So maybe another possibility, like uh, Atmoja's suggestion on predicting the structure, maybe you can come up with some additional auxiliary tasks that might have. Uh, Finding better representations. Sorry, I'm taking note. Mm -hmm. Okay, Zafar Rajam, I think you are raising your hand. Uh, yes, um, hello everyone. Thank you for the presentation, Damla. And, uh, Yes, uh, this this problem is actually quite interesting to me, and in particular, uh, well, for this structural uh, information, 
we are kind of going against like some other frameworks such as like keeping or say like having some invariance assumptions this is quite the orthogonal so we have some sort of groups se's and se3s they're, they're all, all around so i wonder if you have ever checked the directions of like renormalization group theory uh, to kind of better understand what's happening uh, under the hood like in terms of theoretical developments in this framework do you have any potential uh, venues for that like how no. to this if this if this really like work basically that's the, that's the my concern actually we didn't do it hocam what were i mean what was the thing that you said can you repeat so the renormalization group theory is just like it's kind of uh, derived mm -hmm. toolbox from theoretical physics it is basically working on some uh, scale transformation for conformal invariance and uh, scale invariance models so it it is somehow uh, applied to this framework uh, it, i i keep seeing it it uh, some places but i don't know if you had a chance to kind of go through this like recent literature around the theoretical developments of uh, let's say understanding the renormalization group theory on uh, protein protein interactions frameworks actually i didn't see it before but i will check it i took note of it yeah we can check it and maybe try it will help okay. thank yeah, you that, that, that will be really interesting to discuss because i'm working on another aspect of this 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 flow uh, the uh, renormalization group flow uh, but this framework is totally outside of my current uh, let's say application but yeah, definitely that's a really interesting area yes Sajan. thank you okay any other questions comments So if not, uh, let us thank our speakers uh, today. And uh, uh, you really give us more insights about this really hard problem. And I hope uh, you will get good results uh, soon. Hopefully, Ajahn. Thank you. Good luck. See you. Okay.